live from Washington, D.C., it's theCUBE. Covering Inforum DC 2018. Brought to you by Infor. Well, welcome to the nation's capital, a rain-soaked Washington, D.C. Uh, we're here for Inform 18, Dave Vellante, John Walls. We're in the Walter Washington Convention Center, the fourth time Cuba's been at an Infor show and getting bigger and better than ever, David. That's right, John. This is, uh, let's see, the first one was in New Orleans several years ago. Then Infor skipped a year and then did Javits a couple years in a row. That's sort of the headquarters of where in Infor is, is very close to the Javits Center. And uh, Charles Phillips, of course, lives in New York City. And uh, this year they decided to come to the na nation's capital. I mean, Infor is an interesting company, um, about $3 billion in revenue. Essentially, it's a private uh, equity roll-up uh, from uh, Golden Gate and others that really the roots of it are in Lawson Software. Some of you maybe remember Lawson Software, the enterprise you know, uh, software company. Um, and then Charles Phillips came on, and of course he was the architect of Oracle's M&A, mm -hmm. you know, probably spent 30 plus billion dollars for Larry Ellison, remaking Oracle, completely transforming Oracle, brought some of that expertise to Infor in this private equity, private equity play, this roll up, and then bought many, many software companies, rolled them up together, uh, and really started to compete uh, in a, using a different model. So Infor's sort of expertise, if you will, is around so-called micro-verticals. So they cover a lot of different industries, hospitality industries, they've got also uh, you know, manufacturing, ERP, retail et cetera, financial, retail all financial all right, yeah. uh, healthcare, and then they also have horizontal applications like human capital management. Their differentiation is several fold. One major point is they go after what they call the last mile. So they call this micro verticals. So the last mile functionality that would normally have to be customized, Infor does that work for you. Now the advantage of that is twofold. One is you don't have to do a bunch of custom mods, all that hard work is done. The second is, another part of the differentiation is cloud. So they chose several years ago to go with the AWS cloud, put their SaaS on the cloud. Charles Phillips said, hey, when we were an on-prem software company, we didn't manage our own servers for our customers or manage customer servers. We didn't do that. So why would we do it in the cloud? We don't want to compete with Google and Microsoft and Amazon in terms of scale. So we're going to put our software on the Amazon cloud. So that was another point of differentiation. The reason why that's so important in the context of custom mods is if you're rolling out new upgrades on a periodic basis, and you hear this a lot from ServiceNow customers, for example, another cloud software company, you can't do custom mods and then take advantage of the new releases, mm -hmm. right? So it's because you're going to be way behind. Okay, so you, you have to have that hard work done so that you can avoid those custom modifications. And that's something that Infor has been very proud of. Um, so as I say, $3 billion company. Uh, last year they took a $2 billion investment from Coke Industries. Now that investment largely went to recapitalizing the company uh, I think the private equity guys probably took some money off the table, as did the four, what I call the four horsemen. Um, they were the four sort of new founders of Infor, uh, including uh, Charles Phillips, uh, 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 Pam Murphy, who is still there, and then two others, uh, Duncan Angove and Stefan, uh, who have left the company, so they've got some succession planning now. We saw different, two new faces up on stage, um, Soma, and we're going to have some other folks on that we'll introduce you to. But so, now we're entering a new phase, and it's the phase of what Charles Phillips coined human potential. So big focus this year on human capital management. We heard that. Big focus on AI. Mm -hmm. They talked a lot about robotic process automation. Uh, I just had a meeting last night at the, uh, at the airport in DCA with uh, the head of marketing at an RPA company, uh, UiPath. And they're smoking hot. They just raised 225 million. They've gone from like 2 million to 200 million overnight. And um, that space is exploding. It was interesting to hear Charles Phillips talk a lot today about robotic proce process automation, RPA, which is essentially yeah, software. Yeah, break that down for me. So RPA is software robots, and software robots are used to automate mundane tasks, having machines do very specific tasks. So you're seeing this a lot in financial services and a lot of back office automation. It's not physical robots moving around. It's, it's basically software-based processes that machines can do, repetitive processes, that machines can do better, that machines don't get tired. Mm -hmm. So they can do re these repetitive tasks, 
take that away, the, those mundane tasks away from humans, you heard a lot of conversation about that today. You also heard the little competitive fire. So Oracle is now taking ads out against Infor. Mm -hmm. We've seen that. All the cabs here, many of the cabs, have Oracle branding on them. So Oracle's paying attention uh, to Infor. And they're, they're right down the road here too, by yeah, the way. Well, you know, I mean, Reston, Virginia, not far. Right. So this is their backyard. Well, congratulations, Infor. Oracle's paying attention <laughs> to you. That means must mean you're hurting. We've seen this before with others. I mean, we certainly saw it you know, in past days with IBM. We, we see it extensively with with Workday, we've seen some kind of you know tit for tat with 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 Salesforce. Even though Salesforce is one of Oracle's largest customers, so that's been kind of fun, uh, fun to watch. And now Infor, so so Infor clearly is is doing some damage mm -hmm. uh, to the traditional guys, Oracle, SAP, uh, Workday. You know maybe maybe you know not so much. Workday's growing like crazy, but Infor claims it's growing SaaS revenue 50 percent faster than Oracle's SaaS revenue growing at double the rate of SAP and growing as fast almost as Workday is kind of what it claims. And so this whole enterprise resource planning, uh, HCM, vertical market software, horizontal software, the market has always been hot. It's a huge, huge market. Many, many tens of billions. It's probably a hundred billion dollar TAM. Uh, and the big, big whales of course are Oracle and, and SAP and then of course uh, Salesforce, and you're seeing the emergence of companies like ServiceNow, uh, which has a quite a bit of different strategy, but, but with Oracle, with Infor's sort of Oracle heritage, a lot of people in the company came from Oracle, so they know where the skeletons are buried, they know how to compete, they have relationships with the customers, and they're offering some differentiation, as I say, with those micro verticals, the last mile, and the pure cloud model. Now, if you look at the income statement, you'll see the SaaS portion of the business only represents about 25% of the revenues, but remember, that's a ratable model. So you're only recognizing revenue as, you're, as the months go on. So you're billing sort of monthly, if you will, or recognizing monthly. And so, as a result, it skews and dampens the effect of the SaaS software. I think from a booking standpoint, it's probably a much higher proportion of bookings. I would guess closer to, to 50%. As I said, they took $2 billion last year from Coke Industries. That $2 billion didn't really hit the balance sheet. They got about 330 million on the balance sheet. And they have a lot of debt because they you know, did, you know, it was a private equity you know, leverage deal. Uh, they did a lot of acquisitions. So they probably got about $5.7 million, a billion dollars of what they call net debt, which presumably is debt after cash. Mm -hmm. So I would guess close to $6 billion in debt. Um, they're a quasi, they're not a public company, they're a private company, but they act in many ways like a public company. I would suspect within the next couple of years here, if this kind of growth continues, that you'll see an IPO mm -hmm. uh, from, from Infor. Although, presumably, Coke Industries, we heard Coke on stage today, they said they've made $15 billion in investments in technology companies. Two billion, this has to be one of their largest. Mm -hmm. and, but they, it's, but that, that's patient capital. They get the benefit of the cash flow. They can you know, probably take dividends if they want to do that. And if they're smart and they invest and they can take market share from Oracle and SAP and others and gain share in the market space, they can do an IPO. Their revenues are three billion. Their valuation, their implied valuation based on the, the Coke Industries investment is 15 billion. So that if they could take that 15 billion to 30 billion, 20 to 30 billion, right. there's going to be a nice return. You know, I thought it was interesting about Coke too. They talked about it, it's, a, it's, it's a certainly, as you talked about, two billion, right? They put the money in, but they're also, it's a symbiotic relationship in that, that Coke is using its organization as a, as a test lab for a lot of products and services that Infor is producing and allowing them to refine that under the Coke umbrella before they take it out to the marketplace. So that was pretty shrewd. I thought, well, that, that seems to make sense. You have a, a company with 60,000 worldwide employees. You're in dozens of countries. You have a chance to, to let them take uh, their products to scale in maybe a somewhat more friendly or controlled environment before you take it out to the marketplace. That seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah, we heard the CIO of Coke Industries today, and I talked to him last year, they were talking about some of the technical debt that they had, again, going back to those custom modifications that I was talking about earlier, um, they were in this terrible virtuous cycle, almost a negative virtuous cycle, where they had so many custom mods that they couldn't make changes. So the, the applications were becoming fossilized. So they were becoming non-competitive. And that's the last thing that a line of business wants to hear is, hey, we can't make the changes. 
Right? IT says, no, we can't touch the code, it's working. Or changes take too long, they take months or sometimes years uh, to, to get to a major release. And so as a result, Coke was looking for ways to simplify its, its application portfolio and its application infrastructure. The other thing that Coke Industries has brought is it, it, you might notice on the show floor here, you see Accenture, you see Deloitte, you're seeing Grant Thornton. Now these guys weren't really going after or going hard after the Infor base before. I think <laughs> a company like Coke Industries does a lot of business with these SIs. And so I think Coke has introduced the SIs to the Infor opportunity and maybe nudged them a little bit and say, hey, as a big you know, a supplier to us, we're a big customer of yours, we want you to pay attention to that opportunity and in earnest, go look at ways to partner with Infor, and that's happened. My intelligence suggests that there are many multi-million dollar deals that are being catalyzed by these big SIs, and they do a ton of business with SAP and Oracle. So that's another positive and a tailwind that Coke Industries, I think, has brought to the table. All right, you mentioned human potential, which is the, really the overarching theme of the show here this week. Uh, again, we're here in Washington, D.C. I was just listening to Van Jones from CNN, uh, one of their uh, anchors and a political contributor, talking about that as his personal mantra, but certainly that intersects with, with what Enforce is talking about in terms of unlocking human potential and using technology to, to do that. Shed a little light from Charles Phillips' perspective, the, the keynote that he gave, the address he gave, in terms of what it, how do they view human potential and unlocking it with the use of their services. Well, we're going to have Charles Phillips on, so we'll certainly ask him that, but Charles Phillips is a guy with a lot of potential, um, and, and, and that he's realizing that potential. This is a- A lot of track record, too. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. This is an individual with a military background. He became, I don't know if you know his story, but he became a, a highly successful Wall Street analyst. He wrote the seminal piece in the, in the 90s that said the software industry is too many software players and it's going to consolidate. Larry Ellison, prior to uh, reading that, used to denigrate competitors for writing checks not code, meaning his competitors were acquiring companies instead of innovating. Well then, he went on a spending spree, probably 30, 35 billion dollars in acquisitions orchestrated by Charles Phillips. And they totally remade Oracle, starting with the, sort of the PeopleSoft hostile takeover. Um, and then, uh, now you see Oracle, obviously this, this SaaS powerhouse with many, many companies that were bought in. Um, Charles Phillips left Oracle, became the CEO of Infor, and, and, and we heard today, architected an entirely new strategy um, with, a, with a stack. They call this thing the stack. I'll just go through it briefly. I wrote about it last year on the Wikibon blog. They've got a, the Infor platform, the Infor OS, and then it goes all the way up to, to, to AI, the last mile software, the cloud. They have this thing called GT Nexus, which is a supply chain network, and that's where their IoT play fits. Then they bought a company uh, 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 last year called Burst, B-I-R-S-T, to do uh, BI and analytics, and then on top of that is Coleman. So they've got this stack that they're basically infusing into their applications, and I will answer your question. Essentially, what they want to do is use automation and artificial intelligence to essentially coach people, workers, mm -hmm. as they're doing their jobs. So we heard today that there are more openings than there are uh, unemployed, Employees, yeah. uh, and productivity is going down. So Infor, Charles Phillips wants to attack that problem through software and through automation. How do you do that? Well, if you can use artificial intelligence to monitor people's KPIs, they didn't use those terms, but that's essentially what they're doing, and then provide feedback on outcomes. Hey, you could have done it differently. You could have done it m more quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the outcome could have been better if. Uh, also analyzing um, other factors like the relationship, for example, using data to analyze the relationship between, say, tenure, or were you recently promoted, or turnover on the productivity of, for instance, you know, stores, retail stores, for example. And so, you're seeing you know, uh, the infusion of AI and software and automation into the entire application portfolio to unlock human potential. That's one part of it, the other part of it is, Charles Phillips is big on diversity, mm -hmm. um, uh, big on women in, in, in business, uh, and so that's another angle that I'm sure we're going to hear more about this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting too. Um, anytime a show comes to Washington, there, there's a reason, right? Uh, it's, and it's generally you know, federal sector-based, policy-based. There's 
a regulatory undertone of some kind, and, and it was addressed somewhat on, on, the, on the keynote stage here this morning. Um, but the idea, the notion was, was that federal regulation, federal the mandates, whatever, can't keep up the pace. They just can't, and it really is up to the tech sector because it works on a much different time frame, right? I mean, changes are made by the minute, whereas policy gets shaped by the year, you know, up on the hill here, not for about three miles from here, two miles from here. So um, the tech sector's responsibility in that regard in terms of, of being more diverse, of ha being, having more inclusivity, of, uh, of looking at environmental considerations, all these things, and of unleashing human potential and not a, making a government do that, not letting a regulation do that, that certainly plays into Infor's thinking as well, I would think. Yeah, so first of all, so we were down here at the AWS public sector uh, event in June uh, and there were 10,000 people here. So AWS has a huge presence here. Infor and AWS are, are big time partners. And remember the CIA was the first deal, first cloud deal that AWS did. They won, IBM contested it. Uh, the judge eviscerated IBM in his ruling, uh, basically saying they were gaming the system, they were misinterpreting, purposefully misinterpreting uh, the RFP. Amazon won hands down. It was a huge victory for Amazon forced IBM to go out and capitulate and purchase SoftLayer for $2 billion. I, I believe that, that that only helps a company like Infor who has decided to be all public cloud with AWS and, and, and drafting off of AWS's uh, deep ties to various government agencies in the GovCloud. So for instance, AWS was first with FedRAMP, uh, first with a lot of different um, uh, uh, certifications and security hurdles. And so Infor can just draft off of that. Um, you know, CIA, again, big account. Uh, we heard the CIA talk in June mm -hmm. about um, how security on the worst day of cloud is better than his client server applications on their best day. And so I, I suspect Infor's doing business with the CIA, although you know that's not come out publicly, but I would think that there's an advantage that Infor has because of that AWS relationship, and that makes DC all the much more important for them. Well, we are at Inforum 18. We have a full two days of scheduling uh, for you. Great guests coming up here on theCUBE. I'm with Dave Vellante, I'm John Walls. We'll continue here on theCUBE live from DC right after this break. <laughs>